recording. Okay. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for, for coming to this uh, seminar. Uh, this is part of uh, the Visual Intelligence and Multimedia Analytics Lab seminars. And uh, this time, the speaker is one of uh, the people I respect uh, most in, in this domain. Jennifer is a very dear friend of mine. Um, Jennifer is the surveillance litigation director and senior lawyer with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, the EFF is a nonprofit dedicated protection of privacy and civil liberties in the digital world in which we all operate and not just live, at least from our side, we actually are part of creating that digital world. And uh, in 2017, Jennifer has an uh, impressive bio, so I'll be selective. In 2017, um, the First Amendment Coalition awarded Jennifer the Free Speech and Open Government Award for her years, years long litigation against the Los Angeles police and sheriff's departments seeking access to automated license plate reader records um, of, and for setting new president, president in California's public records law. In 2021, the Daily Journal named Jennifer to the uh, its list of lawyers who quote unquote defined the decade, the decade for her work guarding privacy in an over -pol uh, policed world. Jennifer has written influential white papers on biometric data collection in immigrant communities, which is something that I think most of us here will care about. And uh, she also testified on face recognition before the committees in the Senate and the House. And um, Jennifer and I um, have passion for ethical AI from completely different perspective. Uh, we have passion in my lab for ethical AI in terms of how we develop it and what, what algorithms we work on and, 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 um, and how these algorithms could be deployed in the real world. Jennifer has a, a, the same passion from a legal perspective. And I can, I can say this, uh, Jennifer and I have put our money where our mouth is. So uh, we have this, uh, we share this passion. And when, when I sent the announcement last week, somebody, somebody sent me a, a Slack message saying, why are you inviting a speaker who will essentially trash whatever you're doing in terms of face recognition and biometrics? And they said, I can invite the best face recognition researcher in the world, but what will that serve? The person will just confirm our biases. I want to invite somebody who will make us uncomfortable and challenge us to be better researchers and better human beings. With that being said, Jennifer, uh, please um, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Hang on just a sec. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, and let's see. So thank you, Wael, for that introduction. That was awesome. And I hope I can live up to uh, all of that hype. Um, who knows? Um, as Wael mentioned, I'm the Surveillance Litigation Director at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And that means that I'm a lawyer. I am not a technologist or a scientist. So I come at this from the perspective of the law. Um, and EFF is sort of a unique organization because while we work on preserving privacy, security, and civil liberties and new technologies, we do that through litigation. We also advise on policy and legislative change at the state, federal, and international level. We have a team of about 25 attorneys, um, but we're sort of a unique organization because we have technologists on staff who can explain the technology to the list like me. And they also work on their own projects, developing technology that protects privacy by design. So um, I'll start with a little bit of an overview of my talk. I'm going to start with a word about terms and then talk about how the government is using machine learning. What is the rule of law? That'll be a quick primer on constitutional law. And then I'll talk a little bit about machine learning limitations and concerns. I'll give three examples of machine learning used in the criminal justice system and talk about how they challenge constitutional principles. 
I'll talk a little bit about what we're seeing on the horizon, and then finally conclude with questions and discussion. Um, if you have questions along the way, please do let me know. I'm not going to be very good about um, seeing the chat, so maybe somebody could jump in and just tell me if there if there's a question, or you could just speak up. Um, so let's talk a little bit about terms. The federal government is increasingly using machine learning to help with many of the functions of government. In fact, in 2020, Congress established the National Artificial Intelligence Initiative Act, which was to coordinate research on AI and ML. Despite the fact that the government calls this AI, it's not currently using anything that could be considered intelligent, at least not in policing. In general, the government is using systems that are trained to look for patterns, and these may involve some systems that can learn, but they may also just be static algorithms, and the government calls all of this AI. I will probably use ML and AI interchangeably throughout this talk. So how is the government using machine learning? Well, the criminal justice system is becoming automated at every stage from policing and investigations to evidence gathering, bail, sentencing and parole computer systems play a role. AI deploys cops on the beat, audio sensors generate gunshot alerts, forensic and analysts use probabilistic software programs to evaluate fingerprints, faces, and DNA, and risk assessment instruments help to determine who should be incarcerated and for how long. So why should we be concerned about this? Well, there are serious potential harms from al algorithmic decision-making from loss of opportunities in housing or education to social stigmatization, to increased surveillance, reinforcement of racial bias and loss of liberty. So I'm a lawyer, so I can speak a little bit about the law. And uh, a lot of people say that we are governed by the rule of law in the United States. It's kind of become a buzzword these days, but what does that really mean at its heart? And it means that we are governed by a constitution and a set of concrete statutes that are written by humans. We are not governed by the arbitrary will of a few individuals, or at least that's how it's supposed to be. So how did we get here? Well, we actually have to go back to 1215 and the drafting of the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta was one of the first ever guarantees of civil liberties, and it's one of the oldest known legal limitations on the arbitrary use of power. The Magna Carta established that no one was above the law, including the king, and it established several other rights, like the right to what's called due process, and that's the idea that a person's liberty and property will not be taken away from them arbitrarily and without legal process. Now, of course, this meant the property of the barons and the rich non-royals, because most of the people at the time did not or could not own property. The actual Magna Carta was repealed, uh, but the ideas in it greatly influenced the early Americans when they were drafting the US Constitution in the 1780s. So before we had our Constitution, we were a group of colonies in the United States, in the, in the America. Um, and the ideals in the Magna Carta were brought over here, as I mentioned. But despite the ideals in the Magna Carta, the colonists were taxed heavily they didn't have any say in those taxes, and they had little true control over their government. Also at the time, constables like the police could and did conduct dragnet searches through many people's homes and businesses based on blanket charges like seditious libel, which is a crime to punish anything critical of the government at that time, that was the king. So these experiences that the colonists had combined with the ideals from the Magna Carta, led to the drafting of the US Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and it led to the government that we have in the United States today. The US Constitution is mainly an instruction manual on how the US government should be set up and operate. But the Bill of Rights, which is the first 10 articles of amendment or the first 10 amendments, um, protects our core civil rights today. And this was adopted just after the main part of the constitution was ratified. So these core civil rights define the relationship between people in the United States and our government. They apply to everybody in the United States, not just US citizens, but they do not, however, govern any kind of relationship between people and private companies. Several of these rights are relevant for our discussion today. These include free speech and free assembly rights in the First Amendment, the right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures in the Fourth Amendment, 
the right not to be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law in the Fifth Amendment, the right to confront witnesses against you in criminal cases in the Sixth Amendment. Um, I think one of the things I should note is that of course, at the time that this, these were drafted, all of these rights originally only applied to free land owning white men. And the legacy of that still impacts our system of justice today. One other thing to know about the Bill of Rights is that each con individual constitutional amendment is pretty short. In fact, all 10 of them fit on this single page that you see before you. But there are about 200 years of cases that have, in interp have interpreted how those amendments should apply to our daily lives. And in many cases, those interpretations have changed and evolved over the years. So as a lawyer, I can't just look to the text of the amendment. I also have to look at court cases and how they have interpreted um, what that amendment actually means. In addition to the Constitution, we're also governed by state constitutions, state and federal statutes, and administrative rules and regulations, like things issued by the Department of Justice or the Department of Homeland Security. This talk will mostly focus, focus on constitutional rights, but if you have questions about state constitutions or federal or state statutes, I can try to answer them at the end. So here's the problem. How do we ensure that these constitutional principles are followed when machine learning is in part or in whole responsible for government decisions about humans? I wanted to go into a little bit more detail on these constitutional principles. The First Amendment is a, a right to free speech, but it's not just the right to say what you want. It's also the right to say it anonymously and the right to get together with others anonymously. So then the question when we're using machine learning in government is should the government be able to use machine learning to identify and track me? Um, does that interfere with my First Amendment right to uh, say what I want anonymously? With the Fourth Amendment, in general, it requires police to get a warrant before they conduct a search. And this warrant must be based on probable cause to believe that evidence of a crime will be found at the location searched. Also, searches must be based on individualized suspicion. And that means that the probable cause needs to be tied to a specific location or person. The police can't just search everyone or every house in the area just because they suspect that a crime happened in that area. Also, in some cases, it's possible to stop people, ask them who they are, and pat them down based on a lower standard than reasonable than uh, probable cause. And that standard is called reasonable suspicion. It's reasonable suspicion to believe that there's crime happening in the area. But the real question is, what is probable cause? What is reasonable suspicion? These terms are notoriously unclear, and they've been defined and redefined in thousands of cases over the years. In many cases, probable cause or reasonable suspicion is based on a human witness who identifies or provides evidence to the police about a specific person. But what about when that witness is a predictive technology? Is that enough to support a search of something private like a person's home or a cell phone? And is that enough to arrest somebody? And then turning to the, the Fifth Amendment and the 14th Amendment applies all of the Bill of Rights to the states. Um, and it also includes a due process clause. Um, and these two amendments uh, pr protect people and they hold that the government can't take away your freedom or property without an opportunity to understand and challenge why those rights are being taken away. And this gets into fairness, which I'm sure that you focus on in uh, your work on machine learning. Um, and fairness in terms of the due process clause means that you can still have your rights taken away, but not based on the arbitrary will of individuals in power. The real question is, um, with machine learning and the due process clause, which is better or more fair decisions that are made by humans or those made by machines? And is due process satisfied when deprivations of liberty are determined by machine learning? The Sixth Amendment provides that criminal defendants have a right to confront witnesses against them in court and out of court, and this has traditionally also included forensic technologies. But what does confrontation mean when the witness is a technology? What can the defendant ask of that technology or find out about that technology, that witness against them? 
And what does it mean when the company that developed the technology claims that trade secrets bar the defendant from accessing the source code? Is that fair? Machine learning systems have known limitations, which I'm sure all of you know about. They are recognizers. They are trained to see or identify something that they have been shown before. They are not magic future predictors, even when we think that they are. And some of these limitations are um, things that we wouldn't necessarily suspect. As a person who's not a researcher or not a scientist, I might not um, guess that this would happen, but machine learning systems don't see things the way that human do, humans do. And that means that there may be blind spots in the training data. Um, like all the wolf pictures um, in, a, in a pretty classic um, example, all the wolf pictures showed a wolf on snow. And so when the system was shown a husky on snow, it thought that that was a wolf. So if you have an image of a pug on the snow, is the system gonna think that the pug is a dog or is it gonna think that that pug is a wolf? Um, we may not know the answer to that question. Machine learning systems also can't see things that they aren't trained to see. So if you're, you have a face recognition system that's only trained on white faces, it may not be able to even detect uh, faces that are darker. And you may not know that your database is not comprehensive um, until you're testing it on uh, people who are not showing up in the system. Another limitation is that identification is hard. What makes a sandwich a sandwich? What is probable cause to support a police search of your house? What is uh, more likely than not to reoffend? We train machines to perform simple tasks, and then we think that we can extend these simple things into something more complex. And we also know that if we can't get the simple one right, we aren't going to get the complex one right. So if we can't properly define whether what makes a sandwich a sandwich, how can we expect that we can define what probable cause is for a machine? We do know that there are lots of complexities in the criminal justice system, for example, Let's say that we know that Alice is guilty. What should her sentence be? How do we determine that? Let's say Bob has died. Was it an accident, murder, something in between? How does a system identify that? There's also a black box problem. We don't know how these systems work. And when I say that, I don't mean that we don't know how algorithms work in general or how statistical modeling works. What I mean is that we don't know what data many systems rely on and how heavily weighted one data point is over another. And sometimes that's due to trade secrets where companies are trying to protect their own data and their own systems. Um, and some of it's due to traditional police secrecy. But how do you challenge the accuracy and reliability of a system when you don't even know how that system works? And I think there's the accuracy fallacy. What is accuracy? I think a lot of people say that we could just make a system more accurate by collecting more data. But what if the data doesn't exist? And how do we know if machine learning output is accurate? For example, if it's predicting something in the future, like predictive policing, or if it's identifying something that a human can't audit, like a DNA in a, a mixture of DNA. Um, perhaps we can never know what is, some, what is truly an accurate uh, identification. I think another problem that we have to think about is that humans trust machines. Humans have a tendency to put blind faith in technology, especially when they don't understand it. And many of the people who will ultimately use the technology in the policing context will not understand it. People will trust machines in ways that they don't trust humans. We think that machines can't make mistakes when in reality, uh, a system is merely combining lots of human decisions from how the algorithm was constructed to what data was selected to how it was trained and how it was tested. And because we put blind faith in technology, sometimes we can compound AI errors. So for example, using face recognition as the first step in an investigation, even if that face recognition identification is wrong, can bias the investigation toward a particular suspect. And then human backup identification, which has its own problems, frequently only confirms that bias. And of course, this has real world consequences because an inaccurate system will implicate people for crimes they didn't commit. 
And this means that a machine learning system that claims to identify a defendant will shift the burden onto defendants to show they are not who the system says they are, which really flips a criminal justice system on its head. Sometimes researchers will say, well, you can't blame the technology for that kind of follow along human error. But if we know that humans trust machines and we know that humans are part of the system, shouldn't that figure factor into an assessment of the system? I think there's also an existential problem. Maybe some machine learning systems should not be operating at all, even if those systems are 100% accurate. So people attempt to justify the use of machine learning because humans are biased and they get tired and they make arbitrary decisions. But that's the same reason that machine learning can be problematic. All systems are designed by humans who are biased and tired and make arbitrary decisions. And great humans as well, of course, but you know, we all have our failings. Um, and that means machine learning output will be affected by human error. So the question is, do we really want to delegate certain decisions to people who are training a machine? Because that's what it is ultimately. Humans built the machine, humans train the machine. It doesn't suddenly become holy just because it runs on its own. We have to ask, does the operation of machine learning instead of a human, in some contexts, interfere with democratic values, like individuals' autonomy over how they live their lives, and like the fact that our system of government was set up based on the idea that power should lie ultimately in the hands of people over their government and not the other way around. So let's dive deeper into how machine learning is operating in the criminal justice system. I'm gonna focus on three different examples and these include face recognition, probabilistic genotyping and predicting future crime and criminality. So starting with face recognition, well, thanks to some research from a center at Georgetown, we know that more than half of all Americans are in a face recognition database that's accessible to law enforcement. These databases, it's not one database, it's many, many databases, and they include mugshot databases, DMV databases, passport and visa databases, and private databases like the database maintained by Clearview AI. The probe images for uh, identification come from video, social media, traffic stops, et cetera. And the police are told that the face recognition identification should be used as an investigative lead, not a true identification. Sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't. So there are many challenges and issues with face recognition and I'm sure all of you know about sort of the most common of these challenges, including poor lighting and low resolution of images and also bad angle of view. So if the person is photographed from above. Um, and in many cases, these are present in the probe images. So if you're using a, uh, a probe image that comes from, that's a still from a video, um, and that video came from a surveillance camera in, let's say, a 7-Eleven, that camera is going to be shooting, looking down at the person, and it's, it's not going to be, in general, a, a, a frontal shot like a mug shot. So the police are having to deal with these kinds of problems um, that we know about. I think one of the other things that we have to consider, though, is that police are also manipulating the data themselves. So when they have these challenging angles of view or when they have an image of a person who is laughing, uh, police are changing that. They are um, using technology to shift the, um, the angle of view so that a person looks like they're being photographed from the front. Sometimes police are substituting facial features, so they'll swap out um, an open mouth smiling face. Um, they'll just substitute the mouth with a, a closed mouth from another image. That image may be from the same person, it may be from a different person. And sometimes police are even substituting lookalikes. So this was an example from the New York Police Department uh, where the police thought that the suspect looked like Woody Harrelson. And so instead of using the image of the actual suspect uh, to try and identify against the, the mugshot database, uh, police used the photograph of Woody Harrelson. So we also know that training data may be different from how uh, a system is actually used. And if the training data is made up of white people and men, but the use cases are for people of color and uh, people of all genders, 
you're going to have problems in that scenario. So in 2018, Joy Wolomwini and Timnit Garrow published groundbreaking research called Gender Shades about error rates in face recognition systems. This came about after Joy, who is dark skinned, was playing around with a face recognition system that didn't even detect her face. So she tested some of the top face recognition algorithms to see how they performed on black and brown faces as opposed to white faces. The systems were poor at identifying darker faces and especially darker faces of women. NIST confirmed this in 2019, finding that a majority of the algorithms it tested exhibited significant demographic differences in accuracy rates. So how can you judge the accuracy of your machine learning system when it's trained on the faces of white people, but it's used on the faces of black and brown people? The white people who designed these systems probably didn't even think to ask this question. So as a side note, this is why it's so important to have different communities and voices represented in technology. I think another challenge is just the question of how did the police decide to focus on one suspect as opposed to somebody else? Criminal mugshot or face recognition databases generally produce ranked results rather than identifications, positive IDs. And uh, this is a list of potential matches with the percentage chance of match for each candidate. And it requires a human assessment of that match. And it's an attempt to avoid the false positive issue. Um, but sometimes we don't know how the police ultimately decided to go with one person over a different person. Here, the system identified a number of potential matches and the police ultimately went with one. Now the defendant in this case is challenging the use of face recognition in his case, and he's asking for information about the face recognition system, but the police have refused to turn it over to him. This is a case in New Jersey. We're going to be filing an amicus brief in this case in the next couple of weeks. So what could go wrong? Well, of course, people could be identified for crimes they didn't commit. This is Michael Oliver, who was misidentified as a perpetrator by Detroit police and detained for about 30 hours for a crime he didn't commit. The ACLU is representing him and another man named Robert Williams in Detroit, who was also misidentified. Mr. Williams was identified after a video from a watch shop's surveillance camera was run against Michigan's DMV database. So it wasn't like he was even in a mugshot database or a suspected criminal to begin with. But the Detroit police went to his house. They handcuffed him on his front lawn in front of his wife and his two terrified young daughters. In New Jersey, Niger Parks was also arrested after a face recognition false positive from a state identification database identified him. He spent 10 days in jail and had to pay $5,000 to hire a lawyer. People can lose their jobs while they sit in jail trying to prove their innocence. They can be forced to spend a lot of money to hire lawyers to clear their name. They can be ostracized by their families and communities. So I think uh, I wanted to dive in a little bit more about the constitutional issues with face recognition and uh, how they play out. And really to raise the question, should we develop face recognition tools that make it easy for the government to identify anyone anywhere, including people who are not suspected of any crime? And what about at political protests and other gallery, gatherings? Should we allow face recognition to be used in those, um, in those kinds of scenarios? So as I mentioned before, the First Amendment protects the right to anonymity. Um, and because, and that's because the right to anonymity supports our ability to speak freely. And the right to speak anonymously and to associate with others without the government watching is really fundamental to a democracy. And it's not just somebody like me who's a civil libertarian who says that. Uh, our founding fathers in the United States used pseudonyms in the Fed papers when they debated what kind of government we should form in our constitution. For anybody who's seen uh, Hamilton, that was a that was something that came up in that play. So face recognition and similar technologies make it possible to identify and track people both in real time and in the past, including at lawful political protests and other sensitive gatherings. And widespread use of face recognition by the government, especially to identify people secretly when they walk around in public, will fundamentally change our society. It will chill and deter people from exercising their First Amendment protected rights. And countless studies have shown that people, when people think the government is watching them, they alter their behavior to try to avoid scrutiny, even when they have done nothing wrong. 
And we also know that this burden will fall disproportionately on communities of color, immigrants, religious minorities, and other marginalized groups because they are already disproportionately targeted for police attention. What I think about in this context is what would have happened to social movements in the past if we'd had the ability to track and identify people. For example, during slavery, what if we'd been able to track people through their social media or through their cell phones or identify people as they're walking down the street? What about when women organized for the right to vote or when gay people organized for equal, equal rights? And then I think, well, what's the next social movement that won't be able to get off the ground because the government is able to track dissidents? And this has already happened before. The government has used face recognition at Black Lives Matter protests in Baltimore in 2015. So there are other constitutional issues with face recognition, including the Fourth Amendment. If we know that face recognition can be wrong and we know that humans overly rely on face recognition system identifications, should a face recognition match be sufficient to support probable cause to arrest somebody? And then Fifth and Sixth Amendment concerns. Do defendants know that face recognition was used at all in their case? Florida was using face recognition to identify suspects for a decade or more before defense attorneys ever found out about it. And then if the defendant does know that face recognition was used, can they get enough information about the system to confront the witness against them, the technology against them? And do they have the resources to evaluate the system that identified them? So I wanted to turn to my second example. This is probabilistic genotyping. So this involves the crime analysis of DNA. DNA has been used to identify perpetrators for 30 years or more now. In the past, lab analysts could only extract DNA profiles from large biological samples like blood or other bodily fluids. But now we can collect DNA from a surface that somebody has merely touched. And we all shed DNA everywhere we go. We cannot avoid leaving DNA behind, but people shed DNA at different rates. DNA can be and has been transferred to crime scenes. And our tools for gathering DNA from a crime scene now are very, very sensitive. This means that mixtures and degraded DNA where some of the genetic information is missing are much more common. And the problem is that traditional analytical tools used in DNA crime labs and trained crime analysts frequently can't distinguish DNA mixtures. The more contributors or the lower the quality of the DNA, the less likely it is for a human crime analyst or crime lab to get a positive identification. So how do we determine who committed the crime? Well, probabilistic genotyping uses statistical modeling to determine the likelihood that a DNA profile or combinations of DNA profiles contributed to a DNA mixture. This software says it can determine a match in cases where the quantity of the DNA is so small or the DNA is so degraded that the humans can't analyze it. And this technology has already been used in thousands of cases. But probabilistic genotyping outputs can be affected by, well, they are affected by how the model is built. That model can be constructed poorly and the results can vary depending on whether, what, and how the assumptions are incorporated into the system. Each system has a different approach for which and at what threshold factors should be considered, counteracted, or ignored. And also inputs and assumptions from human analysts can change the calculation. So for example, the human analyst will tell the system that the hypothetical number of people who contributed to the DNA mixture is three. But if the mixture contains DNA from five people, that will throw off the results. In practice, different DNA analysis programs have resulted in substantially different probabilities for whether a defendant's DNA appeared in the same DNA sample. But prosecutors rely on people's mistaken belief that DNA never lies. And it's impossible to determine which result or software is the most accurate because there's no objective truth. And it's impossible for a human to verify the results. This raises constitutional concerns. The use of probabilistic genotyping impacts defendants' Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights. Defendants want to assess the reliability of probabilistic genotyping tools to confront the witness to ensure a fair trial but probabilistic genotyping companies have fought very hard against access to the source code, their testing information, and their design. 
We've pushed back on these companies. We filed amicus briefs in cases around the country in support of defendants trying to get access to information about the technology. And finally, in 2021, a New Jersey appellate court held that the defendant's constitutional rights required access to this information. So my third and final example of machine learning in the criminal justice system is the use of machine learning to predict crime and criminality. Police have used machine learning to predict crime, where crime may occur, who may be involved, how dangerous that person might be. And courts are also using machine learning to predict who's likely to commit another crime in the future, and then use that calculation to set bail, to determine pretrial detention, and who should go on electronic monitoring. These kinds of models rely on official crime data, weather, zip codes, social media, who a person associates with, and whether people in a community are more or less likely to be arrested. There are a lot of challenges and concerns with predicting crime. Machine learning systems can't predict crime that they don't know about, and all systems rely on historical crime data. The problem is that historic crime data, historical crime data is incomplete. Not all crimes are reported or investigated. In fact, an average of 50% of crimes are never reported. And reporting, reporting differs widely based on the crime and the location. So we may be able to get relatively good statistics on some crimes like vehicle theft, where there's an incentive to report the crime to the police because, for example, your insurance might not pay out without a police report. But other crimes like rape, assault, domestic violence, we know that those crimes are wildly underreported. A machine learning system can only predict the crime in the future that it saw in the past, and it can only predict that crime will occur in areas in the future similar to areas where it occurred in the past. But that creates a problem when we know that some communities are over-policed, and drugs are a prime example. Health data shows that the number of people using drugs is about the same in poor and rich communities and in black and white communities. But poor communities are much more likely to show higher rates of drug crimes because the police are already in those communities. And in fact, the imprisonment rate for African Americans for drug charges is almost six times that of whites. So a theoretical model based on arrest or conviction data would miss a lot of drug crimes. And it would also refocus police attention on already over-policed communities. So these systems are weighted by human assumptions about who, who violates the law and how that's determined. Some researchers have theorized that all of us commit three crimes a day. That's mainly because there are just so many things that are crimes out there. In fact, it's impossible to know all of the crimes in, uh, in the federal system. People have tried to count them all, but they have failed. The thing that we do know is that you're much more likely to be charged with a crime if you're poor and a person of color. So our crime data reflects that. There's also a feedback loop problem because as new arrests and reported crime are fed back into the system, that reinforces the biased model. There are also biased results um, in determining who, um, how people should be treated after they're convicted of a crime. So in 2016, ProPublica, which is a media outlet, looked at a tool called Compass that's used by courts and parole boards to predict who would reoffend. These systems impact bail and sentencing decisions. And the formula was particularly likely to falsely flag black de defendants as future criminals wrongly labeling them this way at almost twice the rate of white defendants. White defendants were mislabeled as low risk much more often than black defendants. The company that made this technology said their system was fair and that uh, ProPublica got the data wrong. And that's because the system said that it was about 60% accurate in its predictions for rearrests for both whites and blacks. The problem is that it's how you define fairness. The crime data is based on biased policing and blacks are in general rearrested at higher numbers than whites. It's very difficult to take this bias out of the system. And also this bias is easy to hide. It can be whitewashed by a system and look impartial because a machine is making the determination rather than a human. Here in this example on the slide, both Vernon Prater and Brisha Borden were arrested and convicted of petty theft, in this case shoplifting. The algorithm classified Borden as high risk of reoffending and Prater as low risk, 
but the algorithm got it wrong. Two years later, Borden had not been charged with any new crimes while Prater was serving an eight-year prison sentence term for subsequently breaking into a warehouse and stealing thousands of dollars worth of electronics. So here are the constitutional concerns with predicting crime. In the Fourth Amendment context, can a prediction equal probable cause to support a search or reasonable suspicion to stop someone? So for example, let's say that a system has predicted that vehicle thefts will happen in a parking garage at a certain time. Police go to that parking garage and they see a black man in the garage carrying a heavy duffel bag that they think looks like it contains tools to break into cars. Should this be enough to stop the man? Would a man carrying a duffel bag be suspicious under normal circumstances? And would the police have been in the garage in the first place if the system hadn't told them to be there? This may also be used to justify increased police responses to criminal activity. So for example, maybe if they had been in the garage, they would have just stopped the man and asked for his ID. But because the system said that crime was going to occur in that garage, police may stop him with their guns drawn and there might be a much greater risk of police violence. There's also a Fifth Amendment concern, and that is, does the defendant know that predictive technology was used in the case? And also, should machine learning, should a determination made by machine learning deprive somebody of their liberty? This does have a real world impact. Over-policed communities will, be, will continue to be over-policed. We know that African Americans are incarcerated at more than five times the rate of whites, and 56% of the US incarcerated population is Black or Latino, while these groups make up only 32% of the US population as a whole. There are problems because individuals will be targeted for future police scrutiny. These systems are also ineffective. And in fact, they are so ineffective that Chicago police recently quietly stopped using a very controversial predictive policing tool. In Santa Cruz, California, which was the first city in California to use predictive policing, just banned predictive policing this year. So what's on the horizon for AI and policing? Because machine learning and policing isn't going away. Well, companies are already trying to predict a face from DNA. So that's one future use of machine learning. Companies are using crime scene and forensic DNA samples to predict what a system looks like. And then they use face recognition to try to match, though they create a face template, and they use face recognition to try to match that face template to a mugshot database. Other companies are also trying to predict what a person would look like at different ages. And then they use this to try to identify somebody who committed a crime in the past also creating a sort of a false face template and trying to match that against uh, mugshot databases. We're also seeing technology that claims it can identify emotions, determine false and true emotions, detect lying, and determine who is likely to be a criminal or a terrorist. One company, Entech Labs, claimed it could identify emotions with more than 94% accuracy, and that it could identify violent people. It claimed it could spot potential uh, people who are stressed or nervous and alert the police before those criminals act. In another example, researchers in China claim they could predict who would be a criminal based solely on the shape of their face. This is like the new phrenology. And this is a image of the latest issue of Police Chief Magazine, which was um, focused on the future of policing. And this came just uh, this week to our office. Um, and I thought it was interesting because the police are predicting that in the near future, they will be using robots with the capability to make autonomous decisions about whether to use force. And the police thought communities would grow to accept this. In fact, they said the next generation of people will likely be more willing than the current ones to accept AI's autonomous decision-making due to the ever-increasing dependence on computers and technology in our daily lives. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much for listening to this talk. And please do let me know if you have any questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, but um, you could reach me at this email address and YL will have that information. Jennifer, thank you so much. It was amazing talk. And I can tell you, at least from my perspective, you did live up to the hype. So it was <laughs> great. And uh, does anybody have any questions? 
I, okay, I, I do have a question that has to do with the research we, we, um, we're doing in my lab and which you touched upon, but I will say something quickly. Um, I received an invitation yesterday to review a paper on predicting um, uh, uh, personal traits from facial images. And I was extremely conflicted whether I should accept reviewing the paper or not, because I have my own bias. I am totally against this idea. I think it's phrenology and I think it's pseudoscience, but I was conflicted whether I should accept it or not. I reached out to people in my lab to give me advice whether I should accept it or not. But with Jennifer's talk, I think I know what I will do. I think I will accept it and reject the paper because it just doesn't serve science or justice, um, anything. M my question to, to Jennifer, can you, you, you mentioned uh, fairness um, briefly early in the talk. Can you comment on, on fairness in terms of protected attributes and, and applying machine learning in terms of protected attributes as defined by the government, sex, uh, age, um, religion, et cetera, et cetera. C can you comment on that? And then I have a follow-up question. Yeah, sure. So um, with protected attributes, you know, I think we tend to think, well, we need to make sure that our system doesn't look at protected attributes. Um, and so we strip that out of consideration. And in, in the non-machine learning context, I think we are really hoping that people will make decisions that are not based on things like race or gender um, or age. Um, but we know that these um, that these attributes show up in different ways in the system and they're already represented, for example, in policing data. Um, and so like in that example that I gave towards the end of the, um, the algorithm that predicted how likely somebody would be to reoffend, there were a lot of researchers who looked at that after that study came out in ProPublica and after the company said, you know, our system is fair. Um, and the researchers tried to redesign the system in a way that would make it fair in the way that we think about, I think as a, like a civil libertarian, like are black people being impacted more by the system than white people? Like that would be sort of how I would think of it as fair, not is the system wrong the same amount for black people or white people. Um, and research basically, researchers basically found that if you, um, didn't include these kinds of attributes, there was no way that you could actually come up with a system that had a fair result in that Black people were not disproportionately impacted. Um, so I think it raises a real question of how do we uh, take that into consideration? If you're a researcher designing a system, should you design a system that is, can you design a blind system? that doesn't see those protected attributes, or should you recognize that those are going to show up in other ways in the data? They might be reflected in, for example, zip code information, because we know that some zip codes are um, more heavily um, uh, filled with com communities of color, um, and some other zip codes are you know, majority white people. Um, so I, I think it's an open question, and like as a lawyer, I don't know what the answer is to that, but I hope that researchers will think about that. And I think that's what's so great about your lab is that you are inviting researchers to take that into consideration and you're raising these kinds of issues. Thank you. So, so my follow-up question is now, given these biases in machine learning systems in terms of protected attributes and some efforts to make these systems blind, can you also comment on the interplay between um, the bias of, of or unfairness of uh, machine learning system systems and human biases, whether it is uh, intentional or not, in terms of uh, reasonable suspic suspicion and uh, probable cause? How, how does that how do human bias and machine learning bias interplay? Well, I think there's a few different ways. So. Um... Machine learning, I, I said this at the beginning, um, you know, machines can only be trained to see things that they've seen in, in the past that they or to identify things that they've been trained to see from what's happened in the past. Um, and so if we know that um, how humans make decisions is, is, is biased, is uh, based on race, um, then any kind of data that we're going to input into a machine learning system is 
going to have that problem. It's going to have that same problem. And the one of the issues that I'm also concerned with is that we know that fact, um, but we still tend to think that a machine is going to get things right. And so humans have that assumption that machines are getting things right. And it tends to, like I said earlier, whitewash the data. It, uh, it makes us think that the data is not biased because it came out of a machine instead of from a judge who we know is biased because there are definitely biased judges. Um, and that can tend to sort of reinforce the problem that does create that feedback loop problem because the data can be re-entered into the system and um, we just sort of end up with the same result over and over again, or it tends to get worse. So I don't know if that answered your question, but it does. Yeah, it, it does. I, I I agree. It's a really complex subject, and from our perspective, we're also sort of um, we're hardcore machine learning and AI people, so it, it puts us in um, in this awkward position uh, where we we try to balance what we want to do as technologists and what we want to do as as um, ethicists. And I, I if it, does anybody else have any questions for Jennifer? The one thing I will I will say on that, um, one of the things that I think is interesting, so I was talking, so I, I gave that example of emotion detection, and, and you mentioned that you were going to look at a paper on that. Um, I was at a face recognition gathering one time, so it was a whole bunch of people from companies that were working on face recognition, and there was a woman there who was from a startup that was working on emotion detection, and their technology uh, the whole purpose behind their technology was um, to try to identify emotions for people who have autism and may not be able to see or identify emotions. Like as humans, they may not be able to identify emotions. And so they were coming at this problem from the perspective of like, we are going to really help people um, and people will be able to sort of navigate social situations that they might not have been able to before because we will have this emotion detection technology. But sometimes these technologies that are created for benign um, situations then are just used for other scenarios that were not predicted by the original researchers. So I think that's something that we have to think about um, sort of ethically too. It's like, how can the technology be reused or misused? And the, um, the impact of uh, a wrong decision is going to be different if you're a person with autism who's trying to identify emotions in a social situation versus the police trying to determine if somebody is carrying a gun or if somebody is going to cross the border and do something terrible. Um, so the results, what will the impact um, will just be different and be much worse in some scenarios than others. Yeah, thank you. I think this was great. I, I really appreciate your time, Jennifer. And uh, um, if I made anybody, especially in my team, especially in the biometrics wing of my team, if, if I made you uncomfortable, uh, that's exactly what I wanted to do. I, um, I did my job. And uh, I would like to again thank Jennifer. It was amazing. And uh, I want to give her a couple of minutes to catch her breath before she starts talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you, everybody, for attending this. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer.